Okay, today we start the third lesson. Uh, we speak in tongues in this church, obviously. Um, we start today the, the last three weeks of this Bible class. And I know, <coughs> as well as you do, that the materials that we're going to cover today in the first half, in the first half of uh, Holy Week, all the way up to Monday, Thursday, that just about any one of the discourses that we could spend hours on, okay? Especially the end of the world ones. But I'm assuming you guys know about Holy Week. <laughs> so um, <clears throat> next week we'll take the second half of Holy Week, so Monday, Thursday, and Good Friday. And then when I'm on vacation, Pastor Wagenknecht will take, um, in Prescott, he'll take Easter, last chapter of Luke, and here we won't be able to have class. As I'm gone, I couldn't get a pastor for that day. So I'm still going to preach, but you're going to have to watch it. I think it's boring live. Just... Okay. And then if you want to, though, the last Sunday of this month over at our other campus, because Pastor Wade is scheduled to be here, because it, it looks like we may have a baptism that day. Uh, I haven't heard from Matt yet, but their baby's supposed to be born right around now. So they're going to have the baptism that day. And, uh, but at the other campus, we're having Truth and Love Ministries there. So Pastor Mark Kerr, no, no, he's retired. Uh, Star, uh, Pastor Richard Star, Dick Star. He's now the guy that does stuff for uh, Truth and Love. He'll be preaching and leading worship over there and then doing a presentation after church. So if you want to go over there for that, wouldn't be a bad thing either, you know. But we'll put more in the bulletin this week. That's how they respond to the Mormons. Kind of. That's the Mormon ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, I heard him preach on Deer Valley. It's worth the trip over. Oh, yeah, he's, good. he's a good guy. Very good. Yeah. yeah, he's five classes ahead of me. He lives in Salt Lake City. You know? No, no, he doesn't. He works there. But he does most of it remote. So he actually lives down by ALA in the retirement village down there. Okay, yeah, no, no. I asked him that. Okay. Yeah, so anyways, that's coming up um, as well. And, you know, those are always good to go to, too. I couldn't get them for both weeks. That's the problem. So he's they're not, it's still not coming out of Nampa? Sure it is. It's just he lives there. He's doing the development stuff. Raising funds, in other words. So he travels a bit, but he lives down there. Yeah. Hast du verschluckt, Doc? Hast du verschluckt? I'm, I'm not hearing. I just put my hearing aid battery in. I was speaking German, so you maybe didn't understand it anyway. That's why I didn't understand you. Yes, he verschluckt. Nein. Oh. Reckon sie Deutsch nein. Yeah. Nix Deutsch sprechen. Got to get the word order right. Anyways, so um, we'll go through this, uh, and you can ask your questions as we go. But like I say, I'm making assumptions because I know who comes to Bible class, I'm pretty sure. And we just went through Lent, so we just had a reminder of all of it. But feel free to ask questions as we go. You notice under Palm Sunday, Luke 19, 28 to 48, I didn't put a whole lot of questions. I mean, we revisit that every year in one of the Gospels. So you have the, the triumphal entry, and I want, want you to be able to tell me, if you can, <clears throat> what the purpose of Palm Sunday is in the salvation history. He was announcing that he was here. How much did he say that day? Until after there was opposition, Okay, so the only way he spoke would be by action. Go ahead, Liz. It was a fulfillment of the prophecy. Yeah, Zechariah's prophecy of the king coming. But he was very humble. That's right. The point is that his preaching wasn't with his mouth, but by his fulfilling of the Old Testament prophecy in Zechariah. What is it, chapter 9? Okay. That's what the, why it's in salvation history. He's coming now officially to do the job 
of dying for sinners. He had been doing the job of living perfectly for sinners so that he could offer up a perfect sacrifice. We can't offer perfection to God. Even the good things we do are tainted by our sinful natures, right? So uh, we need Christ to clean us of the dirt and clothe us with his righteousness. Kind of a beautiful picture. And Palm Sunday is, okay, I'm coming to do the job. Finish it off. So that's its place in salvation history, okay? And then <clears throat> he ended up in the temple court. And remember what he did there for the second time in his ministry? Jesus. Yeah, he, he, they always talk about cleansing the temple, but really he was kicking them out. Um, most modern archaeologists believe that all of those uh, things happened where the Wailing Wall is today. That wall was there <laughs> back in the time. And if you look at the structure where, where they were able to dig down a little bit, you see arches in there. And they think that that's, they were like tents coming out, a bazaar, that that's where they were. And you know the, this thing about giving unto Caesar what is Caesar's with the Roman coin? The Jews would not allow that coin. So they had to have coin exchanges to the temple coinage. And that's what they were doing as well. Because then they would use the temple money to pay the amount for an animal for sacrifice. Put them in those, what were they, nine boxes, offering boxes? So you only have one. We should go around nine times on a Sunday. <laughs> I'm teasing. <laughs> okay? So that's kind of what he's doing, the money changers. That's what the money changers were, okay? And, and they would sell animals and all that. Problem is those guys were using it as a way to get rich and they were being unfair. So if you're in exchange money, okay, I'll do it for you, but here's your price of exchange, right? You still have to, okay? But they were just taking more. Okay, you want a quarter? You better give me 50 cents. You know, that kind of thing. So they were using God's house as a way to do business instead of a, a place of prayer. So it wasn't that there were money changers, it's what they were doing as money changers, you know? Which is often the case, right? In life? The motive behind it. Weren't they selling a sacrificial animal also? They did, but a lot of times people couldn't afford the whole thing. Or how, how many, if, if you're on a, like this week is Passover week, so Feast of Weeks, or Unleavened Bread, all these people are coming into the town. They're all offering sacrifices. How, how much time do they have in a day to do it? So they would, they would pay money and buy the animal and do it all at one time. Yeah. You can't argue with being practical. They were very practical. And then the other question then finally is, on what day did each event happen? Uh, that's a question for this whole study of the week. And to really do a good job of it, we need to pull out all four Gospels and because they all add a little bit different perspective and some, like John, add stuff that's not in the other ones. That's why um, I think this year we used a compilation, didn't we, in Lent, of all of the readings. Next year I'll go back to Matthew, then Mark, Luke, John, and then I'll go back to the compilation. But reading, reading the whole thing with all the Gospels together really helps with Holy Week, okay? Okay. Okay, uh, number two <laughs> is, is kind of interesting, isn't it? Because Jesus had no opposition the rest of his ministry, right? But in Holy Week, there seems to be an aggressive intent. In other words, they were sick and tired of Jesus taking all the popularity. They were sick of him saying to them, you're going to hell if you don't change your ways. And they were sick of him saying, I'm the one you have to believe in for eternal life. They had had Jesus up to here, maybe up to here, right? And so now they're actually scheming questions and then somebody will bring it forward in order to trap Jesus. And you know how well that went. Never did it, right? Well, they... I believe so. 
Yeah. Now, they may have been doing that more, but we don't have the consistency of one after the other after another during those first two or three days of Holy Week. Now, we just get the highlights, I'm pretty sure, um, what we need to know. But it sure seems that way to me, that it was an aggressive op opposition now. And remember, ever since he raised Lazarus from the dead, they sought a time to kill him, right? That's six months before this. So um, it's amazing what anger can do if you don't put an end to it, or hatred. We've all seen that in history, right? <coughs> Or people that just don't like something and they keep going and going and going until finally they do something like kill somebody. So uh, we see that happening here with the Jewish leaders. The funny thing is, after he rises from the dead and after Pentecost, a lot of these people that were in opposition to Jesus flipped sides. They became believers. And that then became another problem for Paul in the first century church because some of these pharisaical people, they became the Judaizers, Old Testament plus, instead of Old Testament fulfilled. Okay? So, and, and you know the church today has all kinds of things like that from within and without too. So, um, you heard that in the sermon this morning. If you were made, I mean there are a lot of words today. So, I threw a lot of heavy stuff in there today. Right? I mean, division confession, um, the work of the Holy Spirit. Really, we'll spend the rest of the summer talking about different aspects of that, but, you know, it, it, um, it is something to see how the church grew uh, with the opposition as strong as it was. And that hasn't stopped today. We still have opposition. It's, in our country, it's not necessarily direct, although it's getting more and more like that. They're attacking the, the fringes of God's morality, and now it's not fringes anymore. Now they're trying to cut into the middle. And so this whole thing, like, if you don't love the transgender movement, therefore you are not a loving person, is just absolutely wrong. That's like saying, you know, you're not a loving parent if you tell your kids they're not free to play in the freeway. It's the same argument except for when they make it, they don't listen to any other logic because they're fueled by anger a lot of times, I think. Right? A lot of anger and a lot of confusion because they don't have any proper parenting, which usually is because dad's not there and now we're fifth generation of that happening. So those of us who have been blessed to have the same parents our whole life until they died, and, you know, children that are following in the same steps that have gone back for generations, you praise God, but that's becoming more and more a minority. We're going to start seeing some of the effects of this era of history uh, and as people are trying to figure it out and they know what they did was wrong. And they'll start showing up at church, maybe not in my ministry lifetime, but I think in my lifetime, yet, yeah, unless I die today. We're going to see that and how we deal with people that are penitent, but they can't undo what's done. We're going to have to be very loving and understanding, but it's going to have to be a clear confessional statement too, right? Just like, I mean, believe it or not, we have some members that sinned in the area of, of abortion, and every day they lament that they sinned against God in that way, but they're children of God, so we're not going to dwell on that. If you ever wonder why I don't specifically speak about these out of the pulpit, you know, one thing like real specific is because I understand the grieving of people that have committed those sins. Even though I'll say something like divorce is wrong when it's part of the text, I'm not going to hammer on that one sin because a number of our members have been divorced. Some are remarried, some are not. Okay? That doesn't mean that they're not forgiven. You get my point here, everybody? The opposition to Jesus' authority is being questioned. And when we question how we deal with sinners who are repentant, that's also a challenge against Jesus' authority. His authority to say you're forgiven. Okay? That doesn't mean we condone the sin. And that's the hard thing for us, right? Because it's so easy to become a Pharisee. God, I thank you. I'm not like those bums out there. 
And the actual truth is, I am. He who hates his brother is a murderer. Now, unless you've never hated somebody. Okay, that's just one thing. You lusts after a woman is as guilty as sinning as. It's just it doesn't show up in life to others. The heart, the head. You get my point, right? I don't want to beat a dead horse. But I think this is really important for us to keep remembering and praying about. Obviously, we pray that things in government would change this pattern. <clears throat> I'm not too optimistic that the government's all that smart. In fact, I think the government, uh, and he, because they're run by humans, they're anti-God, most of them. And, and that doesn't help. If you ever met somebody who is, I mean, I know people from our church body that served in the House of Representatives in Washington. And you had talked to them and the grieving that they go through because they can't do anything unless they learn how to use the system. It's really sad that it's become that. Anyhow, that's just an opinion, but I'm talking as a pastor now. I have other opinions too. But I mean, that's the pastoral view of how we look at people like that. We need to keep sharing Christ, you know, even if it means our heads. All right. The very first opposition in chapter 20 there, who was the group that came to Jesus that day? What does it say? Chief priests and teachers of the law. When I grew up, we called those scribes, right? Remember the scribes? Now the scribes, um, they were the religious lawyers and, and they were in part of the Sadducees and Pharisees. Here we have the priests coming without declaring that they're Sadducees. Most of the Sadducees came out of the priestly class, as far as I know, okay? And they were heads with the Pharisees, which were, came out of the la laity, basically, and they wanted to reform behavior and let the behavior follow what the scriptures say. So it started out as a positive thing, but you know the pendulum on stuff like that never stays in the middle. By Jesus' time, it was way out here, um, way out to the conservative, ultra-conservative Jewish right um, and uh, they missed the whole point of the gospel, okay? So they're the ones who crested Jesus here, and the reason I do that is you look at these uh, points of opposition, and you'll notice that it's a different group all the time. How and why did the Jewish opposition question Jesus about the authority to preach and do these things? By the way, doing these things, those are the miracles. Who gave you the right to do it, is what they're asking. <coughs> And um, how, how does Jesus respond? He yeah, he asks, answers their question with a question, which I always was taught you're not supposed to do, but I do all the time. Because sometimes I can't address that until I know why you're bringing the question at me. Well, Jesus knew, right? He knew they were trying to trap him. He wasn't going to step into the trap. So he said, okay, I'll answer your question, but you tell me. John's baptism, was it from heaven or from men? And they, they're smart enough to know Jesus turned the trap back on them, right? <laughs> well, if we say from God, then they say, why didn't you listen? If we say from men. So they kept quiet. Jesus said, well, okay, I'll give you an answer too. Not it. I'm not going to tell you anything. Yeah. They knew sure. that Jesus was the Christ with all that they didn't want to believe that it was the Christ. The Christ that God sent wasn't the Christ that fit their mold. No, they were looking for an earthly. Okay. We can, like I said, there's so much in this section. Let's take that point. I'm pretty sure Pastor Wagenknecht's not going to get done either, so it might stretch into July. But, uh, the Bible class. But my point here is, Jesus, they knew he was the Christ but not the Christ they wanted. So they didn't know he was the Christ of God because of the blindness of their unbelief. Okay? They were still in the dark. Okay? okay? Now, now here's the thing. Look at our world in the area of Christianity and invisible churches today. What Christ do they follow? The Christ that God gave or the Christ that they want to have? This is really an important question. 
Is it the Christ that says, I want you to serve me and I'll reward you? Or is it the Christ who says, I came to serve you and because of my work, through faith, I'll reward you? It's not the Christ they want, or at least the false teachers within the group. What's really remarkable to me is how many believers in these kinds of groups that they, they, they don't not teach Christ, but they, they slide it to the side a little bit. And it's amazing to me how many of them end up understanding the scripture properly even though they're being taught differently. Especially in the areas of baptism, Lord's Supper, things like that. Conversion. Do you have to, can you participate if you're dead in your sins with coming to faith? Yes. How? The answer to the question is no, you can't. Because you're dead. But if you go in any Baptist circles, you have to ask God into your heart. That's saying that I have some power intrinsic in me to be able to be a believer. Now, after we become believers, we participate with the Holy Spirit all the time. Right? Yeah. If you ever had any people, I know some of you have relatives in Calvary Chapel. They're the worst offenders of that teaching. Okay? Of all the Protestants, they're the ones I've had the most trouble with over the years. 25 years I've been... Because you don't have that back in Wisconsin or Tennessee. When I was there, they weren't there. So we didn't have to worry about that. Elizabeth. But I know that by the time a person can say that, the Holy Spirit's already working. Well, that's correct. So, you know, do you have the power? By the time you can say, yes, I believe, or yes, you know, I want to be baptized, or whatever, as a second, you know, a new, reborn Christian. Yeah. So they're believers. The problem is that they're teaching not the Christ of the Bible, but the Holy Spirit's still working through the gospel. That's, uh, we've always called that the happy inconsistency. You think of Juan the other day at our house. He actually belongs to Sacred Heart. He is, he is this Hispanic guy. Pretty short, too. Nice guy. But he had the gospel right. If he follows, yeah, taller than you, yeah, well, everybody is. Except your new dog is shorter than you. All right, you get my point, everybody? I'm not trashing believers there. I'm just saying how leaders in the church can have their own picture of Christ. What does the scripture say? And so you've heard me say this a lot, some of you for 12 years already. What's our job? What does the scripture say? That's the only antidote to this kind of stuff. But it's sure made a problem in the church. And if you really listen to some of those, I've had people come into uh, churches of mine uh, who came out of Calvary Chapel, and when they were searching because they were so beat up, I'll never get into heaven. How can I? I haven't done it right. And the more you teach that, that's the outcome of that kind of teaching. God preserved those folks. You know? So what I'm getting at is there's still opposition to Christ today in the church, just like the Sadducees, Pharisees, teachers of the law, priests. Let's just not be that ourselves, okay? We want a different Christ than the one the Bible reveals. Okay, the next one, I'm not going to go with uh, the parable of the tenants. We talked about uh, similar parables before. The, the thing about this one is... Um, he rented out his vineyard to some farmers and then he went away for a long time. Hmm, sound familiar? It's been 2,000 years he went away. He'll be back to collect, you know, on Judgment Day. And uh, the tenants uh, were supposed to give the money back, you know, the proceeds to him while he was away. While he's away, we're supposed to give God the fruits of our faith, right? That's called stewardship, <laughs> you know, of every aspect of our life, serving God humbly like Christ served us. And of course they beat up the guys that came to ask for that and finally they sent the son. And what did they do to the son? They killed the son. Hey, if we kill the son, we'll get it for ourselves. Uh, I don't think it worked out that way, did it? Because finally, 
What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. And that's exactly what will happen when Christ returns to those that have rejected him. He was telling them that they were going to kill him. Of course he was. That's what comes next, right? The build, stone the builders rejected have become the capstone. So he's saying that's exactly what this is about here, okay? And they knew it. Verse 19, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. Okay? The next one is usually better taught, you know, around April 15th. <laughs> All right? This is... Oh yeah, we got another one coming up, don't we? Keeping a close watch on him. <laughs> you know, I, I hope that you as God's people don't keep a close watch on me as uh, the pastor here. Uh, because if you did, you'd notice I'm not perfect and all of that. Uh, I can't be, but I hope what you would see is that faithful to the word, right? I hope you see that. Uh, so there is always that little bit that leaders of God's people are always watched in some respects. New people watch really much at the beginning. Uh, they're really checking you out, especially those who haven't found a place where they can belong as uh, in a family of believers. Uh, we have a family like that right now. They were sitting in that row today, and I had a great visit with them this week and everything. But... Um, they never felt comfortable any other place till they came here. They heard the gospel pure. And that really says something, doesn't it? So hopefully I won't do something stupid and then they leave again, right? Because people, when they leave, it's always because of the pastor. Not always, but a lot of times. Because of Satan's now. Well, no, but I mean, that's their excuse, you know. All right, that's just an excuse, yeah. not the reason. All right, paying taxes. They sent spies. Bless you. Sent spies among God, uh, Jesus' followers, right? And they pretended to be honest. They hoped to catch him in something he said so that they might hand him over to the authority and power of the governor. And what way was best? Well, we'll, we'll talk about paying the Caesar, you know, because if he's there in revolt, there you have it. Right? So they ask, Teacher, we know you speak and teach what is right. Ah, uh, they were speaking untruthfully. You're in the wrong place. <laughs> and they then you do not show partiality, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. They were dishonest. That's not what they believed, but that's what they said. Okay. They're trying to butter him up, you know. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? I think this is such a... Jesus must have just... His heart must have been ripped apart because he came to die for them too. Like he wept over Jerusalem as he's coming in to Palm Sunday. And how I wanted to gather together like a chicken gathers her chicks. And you would not. Remember it says he wept? And he knew... He's God after all. He knew that they were trying to set a trap for him. You just, you just hear the, the anxiety coming up. <sighs> Give me a coin. <laughs> That's kind of what we have. Whose picture's on there? <coughs> well, it was Tiberius by that time. Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and unto God what belongs to God. <coughs> kicked them in the teeth and sent them away with a bloody mouth. They were unable to trap him in what he said there in public, and astonished by his answer, they became silent. Shut him up. Well, at least for a few days until they cried out, crucify him. Interesting. This is a really cool story. I mean, if you don't want to pay taxes to Caesar, in our case, to the U.S. government, well, then... You're violating the fourth commandment, you know, right? Render unto Caesar. Do we like what they do with the money all the time? I don't. 
but God's going to judge them, who are, those who are in a position of handling it. That's their responsibility. In our government, that's the way it's set up, so we pay honor. Just like they had to the Caesar, and by the way, the Roman government was a lot more crass and, and uh, problem-filled than ours is today, although it's getting close. Yeah, perverting justice. Just, it astonishes me how much we talk about the transgender stuff and abortion and the multitudes of U.S. citizens that are struggle for mental illness get very little help. You find that out when you start looking for doctors and stuff that take Medicare. Yeah. Anyways, that's another question. Okay, the next one then is resurrection and marriage. Now we're told a different group. This is the Sadducees. And it tells us right here, Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection of the dead. No bodily resurrection. Now most of the Sadducees were priests. You'd think they'd figure that one out from scripture, right? Okay, well, let's see. There's a whole lot of pastors in our world today that are female. There's a whole lot of pastors that are female lesbians. There are a lot of pastors today that don't believe what the scripture says about gender. That's a fact. What does the scripture say? Okay? So it shouldn't surprise us that the Sadducees, who were supposed to be the people caring about this stuff, wouldn't believe in it. And they're the ones that came with a question of the resurrection. They used the Leverett Law, which says, if a, a man dies, a married man dies while having a kid, then the next <coughs> one in line, brothers, then relatives, would have to marry that woman, and be, she, she would become his wife, but the first child born, first male child born, would be considered the son of the dead brother. And that way the family lines would keep alive in Israel until the Christ came. That was all part of that tying with the promise of the Savior, okay? Well, how many did it go down the line? How many did? The, seven. seven without having any kids. And then she died too. So, whose wife will she be in heaven? How stupid, they didn't believe in the resurrection, so why are you talking that way? Well, Jesus knew that too, right? He says, you guys are dumb. You don't know what the scripture says. You're idiots. In the resurrection, people will be like the angels, in the sense that they won't be given into marriage or being married. So there's no marriage in heaven. I don't know about beer, but I know in heaven there is no marriage because the Bible says so. I don't know if that song's right, right? In heaven there is no beer, that's why we drink it. Anyways, just check it to see if you guys are following me. <laughs> uh, all right, so, a um, minute left. So, uh, Jesus says in marriage, there's no marriage in heaven. But then he says, They're like the angels. How so? Not in the sense that they're constructed the same way. Angels are spirits, right? We'll still be people in heaven. Okay, just so you know, our bodies will rise from the dead. But like angels, they don't, they don't have kids. Okay? And we'd be like them in status before God. Somebody asked me about the devil before. He was a created angel who rebelled against God along with a bunch of his followers. And so um, they, of course, won't be in heaven. They are God's children since they are children of the resurrection. Oh, he hammers them right where they didn't believe. Believers who die and rise again are children of the re resurrection. We come from the day, dead. We're born again from death to life, just like we were when we became believers, right? And then, why are you talking the way you are about the resurrection, you Sadducees? We don't have a dead God, we have a living God. Remember the burning bush? He's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's the God of the living, not the dead, even though those three patriarchs were dead for 400 years by that time. There's a lot of comfort in this section. Uh, and uh, 
I think we're going to have to stop there with whose son is the Christ. I'll see how far Pastor Wagon can I got. <laughs> he told me this morning he's not going to get through the whole thing. And I said, well, we'll try. So might have to wait till the resurrection until I am resurrected from my vacation. I'm going fishing. Let's pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you that in love for us and the world, you sent your Son in the flesh to bear our iniquity and endure our sorrow and punishment. We thank you that you raised your Son from the dead after he successfully did the work of, of caring, uh, taking care of the world's sin and guilt. Now, triune God, bless us with strength of faith through your word and sacrament. Bless us with all we need to live for you in this world. And bless us especially with the knowledge that we are forgiven, your children, that have an inheritance in heaven waiting. We pray all this in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen.